please stand for today's gospel lesson. Today's lesson comes from Luke chapter 12, verses 13 through 21. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But he said to him, Friend, who set me to be a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take care, be on your guard against all kinds of greed, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Then he told them a parable. The land of a rich man produced abundantly, and he thought to himself, what should I do? For I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life is being demanded of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves, but are not rich toward God. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. You may be seated. So it is for those who store up treasures for themselves, but are not rich toward God. This would be a great one for a stewardship sermon, huh? <laughs> On you guys giving more money to the church? We're not going to go there today, though. That's not, that's not what we're going to do today, because I don't know that that's exactly the point of this text. So um, there are four Gospels in the Bible, right? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And believe it or not, these are pretty different from each other, even the three that are similar. They were written by different communities and written for different communities. And they have different themes. Like you can have a list of kind of the main themes of Mark, which was the first one that was ever written down. And then the main themes of Matthew and the main themes of Luke and of John. And so the gospel of Luke is, is the gospel that we've been focusing on this whole year. We use the lectionary in this worship service. And so the Gospel of Luke has been with us for a while. And one of the largest themes that constantly pops out in the Gospel of Luke is the theme of um, a preference, God's preference for the poor, for the widow, the orphan, and the foreigner. And this roots from something called the prophetic tradition. So as a rabbi, Jesus would have had the entire Old Testament memorized, which is crazy for us to think about. That's a lot of words, right? But he would have had these books memorized. And different rabbis had different ideas about kind of what was more important, than, like which things out of the Old Testament were the most important that they based their ministry off of. And it's in the prophetic tradition that we find... Um, it's throughout the Old Testament, but especially in the prophetic tradition, we find this preference that God has for the most vulnerable in society. The widow, the orphan, and the foreigner. These were people who could not own land, who could not provide for themselves, and depended completely, completely on the generosity of others. And so... So we've got this, uh, this main theme kind of running through the Gospel of Luke. Um, and and it's, it's, you know, it's like unavoidable. If you spend a lot of time with this book, it's kind of just something that keeps coming back up. And that's why the, the people that really love the Gospel of Luke, then they, they say that's their favorite gospel, are usually those people who are very focused on justice and compassion. Um, Luke's also very kind toward women compared to other Gospels. Um, but Jesus didn't just like come up with this on his own, right? This is part of the prophetic tradition, and it's something that we see throughout the Old Testament as well, even in, in the first five books in Torah, the focus on law and how we're supposed to treat people. Um, and it was, it was how the community treated the least of these. Um, this was how God would judge the rest of society and, and the relationship. So 
So if people were hungry and not being taken care of and were being exploited, that meant that God was hungry, not being taken care of and exploited. So if you ever wanted to know how God would be judging how a society looked, all you had to look at was the most vulnerable people in that society. And that's how the Old Testament would judge how the people in the Old Testament would judge how well the people were in good relationship with God. So Jesus really, really likes this tradition in the, in the Gospel of Luke. It's in the Gospel of Luke that Jesus' first sermon includes a quote from the prophet Isaiah. Right? The first time we hear him speak and start his ministry, he says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. I brought this piece with me. It's one that hangs in my office. Um, the artist's name is Haiki. He's an Asian cubist from Minneapolis. And I always thought that this piece really represented Luke's Jesus. We've got the naked that, are being, that need to be clothed, the widow, the orphan, the slave, the captive those whom Jesus have, has come um, to be with and to be for. Luke's gospel has this theme throughout its entirety. In Jesus' interactions with common people, in Jesus' interaction with religious leaders especially, we hear a lot of attitude come up. Um, and it's definitely found in his parables. So this is a call and response part. What is a parable? A story. Sometimes instead of saying, you are the problem, to someone's face, it's easier to tell a story. It, it, it's easier to kind of make sure that everyone gets the point. A fable or a parable or midrash. These are all very similar. Um, and that brings us to our text for today. So there's a man standing in the crowd, and he says to Jesus, tell my brother to split the family inheritance with me. Now, there's a chance that this was a younger brother. In Jesus' time, the older brother would have been given two-thirds of the, of the land and of the inheritance, and the younger brother would only get one-third. But either way, Jesus' response is like, I'm having none of this conversation. This is so not what matters. He immediately turned the story and the whole mood into talking about the temptations of greed. One's life does not consist of possessions, he says. And then he tells a parable of a rich man who was a landowner. And on this particular year, the land had produced abundant crops, like enough to fill the grain elevators completely. And those are never filled completely. You know, you have the extra storage space always because they never get full. But on this year, they were full and then some. And so the man says, what am I going to do with all this extra food? I know. I'll tear down my existing grain elevators and I'll build bigger ones. And that way I can hold all of this stuff that I have grown myself and that apparently I need to hold on to. But God says to the man in the parable, you fool. You will die tonight. And then who's going to get all of your stuff that matters to you so very much? And he ends the parable with this statement. So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves, but are not rich toward God. There's that stewardship line again, right? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves, but are not rich toward God. So what does it mean to be rich toward God? What does that mean in the gospel according to Luke? This one that holds this deep prophetic tradition. What does it mean to be rich toward God? One of the greatest messages that we receive from the prophets is that the way that we love God is similar to the way that we love our neighbors, or the way that we love our neighbors is the way we love God. The two are identical. And greed 
simply cannot exist in either of those types of love. Greed is inherently self-centered. And we're all guilty of it, all right? I'm not pointing fingers at any one of you. I'm pointing fingers at all of us. Greed is inherently self-centered. Greed makes the rich man in the parable think only of himself. What about his neighbors who don't own land? It like doesn't cross his mind in this story, right? What about the most vulnerable in society? Loving our God and loving our neighbor is inherently outwardly focused, right? The, and the gospel of Jesus Christ is inherently outwardly focused because the gospel according to self is simply not gospel. The word gospel means good news, okay? When you are focused on yourself, does it ever feel like good news? I'm tired of hanging out with myself by the end of the day. The things that I do on my own, my own daydreams, like where I have delusions of grandeur and where I always am like the one who's winning or, or who sacrifices myself for other people, it's a lame story and it wouldn't sell very well. It's not good. It's inwardly focused. But the gospel, the true good news, is something that's outwardly focused. It's focused on neighbor. It's focused on God. It's focused on something not of myself. And that's what's so good about it. In fact, the root of the Old Testament laws about giving to the poor, to the widow, to the orphan, to the foreigner, the laws around giving to the most vulnerable were not given to the people of God because it was just like the right thing to do, okay? Or because God preferred that kind of an ethic. Ethic is a term that came very recently in human history. It's not the, the way we talk about it like that today. Um, the purpose of the law was always about relationship and response to God, okay? So, so we give... We give to the orphan, the widow, the foreigner. We give to each other out of response for what God has given to us. We give because there was a time that we didn't have anything. There was a collective story, a memory that the people held on to. The Old Testament scriptures would say, remember that there was a time when you were once slaves in Egypt. So when you harvest, now that you have land, you give something to those who don't. Remember when you were once a slave because one time you had nothing and now you have something, so now you give. God says, I gave, I gave, and I gave. I gave grace, I gave freedom, I gave relationship, I gave wholeness, I gave and I give, so now you Give. It's a reminder of the relationship, right? It's like the way you give to your spouse or your friends or your children, right? Out of love, out of respect, out of commitment. Because, because being in those relationships and respecting them and caring for each other matters. And it reminds you, oh, it's really important in this life. And so God calls us beyond those boundaries to the people who we don't share a home with to the people on the other side of the town, to the people that we don't normally associate with, who are also God's children. My brothers and sisters in Christ, our relationship with money and with goods and with stuff is not a relationship that we are in alone, no matter what rugged individualism wants to say. There are some truly finite resources on this planet. Our story gave the example of land. Land is a finite resource. And because there are certain resources that are finite, that are limited like this, who has them and who doesn't have them affects all of us. Just like it did in Jesus' day. And we may want to believe that there's certain resources that we deserve more than others, but God calls us out of that assumption when we are in good relationship with God. God calls us out of the assumption that we are alone, 
and that we don't affect others in our relationship with our stuff. We are way more interconnected than that. And that's a holy and good thing. In Jesus' time, and in our own time, people, many, many, many people, have been exploited so that a few could have much, much more. We must consider that our relationship with wealth in all of its forms mirrors our relationship with God and with others. There's something very true about the idea that we put our money where our mouth is. Our stuff is intertwined with the stuff of the person sitting next to you. And that's the reality. No matter if we go home to our own houses at night and close our doors, we are intertwined. And our stuff really was God's stuff in the first place. So what does it mean to be rich toward God in your context? Because everybody's got different things to give. And everybody does have something to give. So what does it mean to be rich toward God in your context? What does it look like to respond to God's ever-giving, ever-flowing fountain of grace? Do you take that water and bottle it up and sell it for $1.99 a pop? Or do you share that grace? Do you share what you have been given in the knowledge and hope that it is continuous and always flowing? Because that is what the love of God is and that is what the grace of God is. And we do it. We do it because there was a time when we were in Egypt and we were thirsty too. Amen.